Okay, this lecture is concerned with what is called an analog gauge, and then afterwards an electric motor. Analog gauges and electric motors are the primary applications of what happens when you have a loop of wire placed in the presence of a magnetic field such that a torque is exerted upon that loop of wire. This is the primary means with which we are able to transform either electric or magnetic potential energy into something that is useful, say, rotational kinetic energy. All right, so all analog gauges have at their heart what is referred to as a galvanometer. And it's the primary application of placing a loop of current in the presence of a magnetic field such that a torque is exerted. So you then are able to transform electric and magnetic potential energy into rotational kinetic energy. Okay, give you a moment to copy that. Pause if you have to. Okay, I'm going to draw now a rather kind of messy, complicated diagram which shows the situation of what happens when you have a galvanometer. Okay, so first of all, I have to have a magnetic field. Okay, that magnetic field is caused by a permanent magnet. So right here, we'll say is the north pole of that magnet. Right over here is the south pole of that magnet, such that then the magnetic field here goes from left to right on my diagram. So right here is the magnetic field, B. Okay, and now let's say that I have a conventional current, so then therefore I first of all have to have a potential difference, I have to have a battery. Let me draw that like so. Here's my potential difference V. And then I'm gonna draw my loop of wire like this. Like so, and then this rectangular portion here is referred to as the armature. That's a term that's a little bit more important when talking about electric motors, but it also applies here to galvanometers as well. Okay, now my conventional current is basically going to flow clockwise here on the diagram. And then let's take a look at this side of the rectangular loop like so, where the current flows like this, and this side over here, where the current flows like so. Okay, now we don't necessarily have to use the torque equation to describe what happens here. Instead, the force equation is perfectly fine. So recall from earlier that F equals IL cross B. All right, so let's go ahead and do the cross product on the left and right hand side here of this rectangular loop to understand the direction of the forces that are in play. So first of all, over here on the left hand side, we have IL like so, cross B to the right, then gives us a force vector that's into the board. I'll just go ahead and draw it like this. So right here in black is the force vector like so. And then over here then on the right hand side of the diagram, now in this case we're going to have IL downwards like so, cross B to the right hand side, then gives us a force vector out of the board. So right over here like so, coming out of the board, is a force vector like that. So then therefore this then means that this rectangular loop of wire is going to begin to torque, it's going to begin to twist. Specifically it's going to twist in this direction like so. Now in a galvanometer, as this then torques over to the right hand side like this, there is a counter torque that is exerted upon the rectangular loop of wire by means of a coiling spring. That coiling spring is usually placed somewhere here in this basic design like so. So this spring provides a counter torque as the rectangular loop twists
eventually the counter torque will then match the torque that is exerted upon the rectangular loop-like cell, such that then it just ultimately remains at rest here in place, say like this, in this simple diagram. So eventually, the two torques cancel out. Okay, now what we then do is we attach a needle then to the rectangular loop. That needle is going to be perpendicular to the loop, so I don't have to use my vector here to demonstrate. It's basically going to point something like this into the board, such that when this eventually torques over to the right-hand side, then the needle swings over to the right-hand side. And then when the needle swings over to the right-hand side, we then match up the needle by means of a gauge of some sort, like you would see on a multimeter, which we can then turn into a voltmeter, and we could also turn it into an ammeter exactly how that works I'll get to in a few minutes, but a voltmeter reads voltages and an ammeter reads current. These are the simplest applications of a galvanometer. These are basic types of analog gauges. Okay, now I'm going to kind of have to draw this, however, in a rather haphazard manner. Okay, right here we'll say is my needle, like so. Okay, the needle points into the board. And then here in the background, like so, is some sort of gauge that you would see, like for example, on a multimeter. Okay, now the amount of current that is necessary to pass it through the galvanometer such that the needle swings all the way over to the right-hand side is very small. This is referred to as the full-scale deflection current. amount of current necessary to cause the needle to torque all the way to the right on my simple diagram is very small. This is called the full-scale deflection current. It's usually measured in terms of milliamps. So then therefore, how do you use a galvanometer to read large amounts of voltages, like say 10 volts like we did in our simple laboratory exercise? or turn it into an ammeter where we could read relatively large amounts of current. Well, in the case of a voltmeter, what we do is we place in series with the galvanometer a large amount of resistance. This then makes the amount of current that is passing through the galvanometer very small, less than or equal to the full-scale deflection current. In order to turn it, however, into an ammeter that reads then for us large amounts of current, then what we have to do is we have to place in parallel with the galvanometer a low amount of resistance, such that when current passes through the instrument, most of the current then goes through the low amount of resistance that is in parallel with the galvanometer. The easiest way to understand what I mean in this simple explanation of these two different types of analog gauges, voltmeters and ammeters, is to just take a look at two basic problems. So right now, go ahead and copy down the problem from the lecture examples. There's a part A and a part B. In part A, we'll examine what happens in the situation set up as a voltmeter. And then secondly, in part B, the situation will be set up as an ammeter. So go ahead and pause and copy down that problem. I'm going to erase the board. Okay, so referring to the problem I have it cast up here onto the screen, the galvanometer has resistance of 75 ohms. The galvanometer itself usually has a number of twists associated with the wire itself. This then increases the resistance. You frankly want to make the resistance large for the galvanometer itself because you never want to pass a large amount of current through it. And by the way, if you do pass a large amount of current through the galvanometer, then basically the whole thing is going to snap. Basically the whole thing is going to break, and obviously you don't want to have that happen. 
Okay, now full scale deflection. That means that the needle swings all the way over to the right hand side. That occurs when the current passing through the galvanometer only equals 1.6 milliamps. So that's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3 amperes. Okay, determine the value of what is called the auxiliary resistance. It's the other resistor that is required for the following. First of all, part A. Okay, now what we do want to do here in part A of the problem is we want to turn the galvanometer into a voltmeter that reads one volt at full scale. So in other words, when the needle is swung all the way to the right hand side on the gauge, that corresponds to one volt. Okay, basically here's what the multimeter looks like when you have it set up as a voltmeter in this situation. Okay, so first of all, we have the full scale deflection current that would pass through the galvanometer such that this happens. And it's usually referred to as I sub G. So this is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3 amps. Okay, the resistance of the galvanometer itself, I'm going to refer to this as small r. That's given to us as 75 ohms. And then we want the potential difference to be read here as 1 volt. So then therefore I'm going to say V is equal to 1 volt. Okay, here's what the multimeter looks like when it is set up as a voltmeter for this situation. Okay, so first of all, here are, for example, the black and the red leads that you saw when doing our simple laboratory exercises when I had you use a voltmeter. And you then place the leads across some sort of circuit element such that it is then in parallel with that circuit element. So the circuit element is down here somewhere. And then what we're given is that the potential difference from one side of the instrument to the other V, that's given to us as one volt. Okay, now within the instrument itself, you basically have the following. First of all, you have the auxiliary resistance that we're trying to find. This is referred to as capital R. And then the galvanometer basically is two things. There's first of all the needle that swings all the way over to the right hand side. And that's just drawn as a circle with the letter G in it like so. And then we have the resistance like so small r of the galvanometer itself. This value here is 75 ohms. We only want however a very small amount of current to actually go through the instrument. Specifically this value here, I sub G. So then therefore, the auxiliary resistance R has to be large. And now we just add up the potential differences in the following way. The total potential difference from one side of the instrument to the other is one volt. That's the same thing as this. So then therefore, the one volt here, V, that's going to equal IR plus another IR like so. Like this. And now all that we do is we just solve for capital R. That's all. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and move this term to the other side, like so. And then I'll go ahead and divide them by I sub G. And that then gives us the auxiliary resistance capital R. Okay, let me go ahead and calculate that. And it will be a large number. And the reason for that is because remember that the full scale deflection current is small. All right, so the voltage is just 1. And then minus uh, 1.6, 1 minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3. Multiply then by 75 ohms for the internal resistance of the galvanometer, and then divide it by I sub G. Like so, and that would be equal to, then in this case, it turns out to be quite large, it's 550 ohms, like so. Okay, let's say that the potential difference, however, was less than one volt. Well, if the potential difference was less than one volt, that would just simply mean that I sub G here would be less than the full scale deflection current. So then therefore the needle wouldn't quite swing as far to the right hand side. It would say only end up halfway if you were talking about a half a volt, like so. So then therefore the full scale deflection that corresponds to the maximum value that you want to read. In this case, in part A of the problem, we want to read at full scale deflection, one volt. So that's how a voltmeter works. And then when I switch the dial itself on the voltmeter, you'll see that in my demonstration video later. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm changing the value here of the auxiliary resistance, okay? Okay, so that's part A. Okay, now in part B, we're going to turn the instrument into an ammeter. An ammeter reads current. So let me go ahead and do some erasing here.
Okay, so now turn the galvanometer to an ammeter that reads 0.05 amps at full-scale deflection. Okay, with an ammeter, then, the instrument looks like this. Okay, so once again, here are the leads of the multimeter, like so. If you take those leads and then place them across a light bulb, for example, now we want to measure the amount of current that's passing through the light bulb. That's the idea. Okay, now contained within the multimeter itself, however, the galvanometer is now in parallel with what is called the shunt resistor. That's the auxiliary resistance that we're asked to calculate. So it then looks like this. So let's say right here is the galvanometer when it's resistance, small r like so. And then what we do is we place it in parallel like this with a shunt resistor as it's referred to as this is the auxiliary resistance that we're trying to find here, capital R, like so. Okay, now the amount of current I that is passing through the galvanometer is what's given in part A. It's 0.05 amps, or excuse me, passing through the multimeter. It's 0.05 amps. However, we only want a tiny amount of it to go through the galvanometer because if we pass a large amount of current through the galvanometer, then it's going to break. So then therefore, passing through the galvanometer, like so, is our I sub G again, like so, <coughs> such that the needle will swing all the way to the right-hand side for a full-scale deflection. This then means that some of the current, actually most of the current, has to go in this direction, like so. Okay, let's just refer to this here as I prime. And then what we'll do right here is just apply a little bit of junction rule. So we have the conventional current I equal to this value coming into the instrument, and it then splits off into I sub G plus I prime. Okay, so let's go ahead and just calculate what I prime is. We know what I and I sub G are, so let's just find I prime. And that's just the difference between the two. So it's 0.05 amps and then minus and then the full scale deflection current. So 0.05 minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, and that comes out to be 0.0484 or so amperes like so. Okay, and now let's just do a little bit of uh, potential difference here for two branches of a parallel circuit. So the potential difference here, IG times little r, has to equal the potential difference here, I prime times capital R. So, and now we just solve for capital R. As we'll see, it's quite small in this case. Like so. So now I just have to plug in and then go ahead and solve for my values. Okay. All right, so let's see, doing the calculations here. Uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3, multiplied then by 75 ohms through the resistance of the galvanometer, and then divided by the I prime that I just calculated. Okay, and that comes out to be about 2.48 ohms, like so. So then therefore, by manipulating this value, this then changes the amount of full-scale deflection that you can measure. So we're turning this uh, galvanometer here into an ammeter, such that full-scale deflection is reading this value. If this number was less, however, than 0.05 amps, all that would simply mean is that the needle wouldn't swing all the way over to the right-hand side. It would swing over halfway, for example, to read a low amount of current. By changing the value, however, of the shunt resistor itself, that then changes the amount of current I that you can then measure. So I demonstrate this once again by using the multimeter in the demonstration video. Go ahead and take a look at that demonstration video now if you haven't already done so. Also in that demonstration video, however, are the basics of how an electric motor works. Let me go ahead and cover that here as the last portion of this lecture. Okay, so qualitatively speaking, here's how an electric motor works. Okay, let me begin by drawing basically the exact same diagram as I did earlier for the galvanometer. Okay, so once again, here's the north pole of my magnet. Here's the south pole, and then my magnetic field once again goes from left to right. Like this. Actually, let me draw the letter B here onto the side. There we go. 
go, like so. All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and draw in my current loop. So here's my battery, potential difference V. And here's my armature, like so. Conventional current I flows through like this. And then as we had earlier, we would have our force vector like so. And then our force vector coming out of the page like so. Okay, now watch the problem that we encounter here if I now have this thing rotate, for example, through 180 degrees. So there's a problem. <laughs> Let's take a look at a 180 degree rotation. And this is going to kind of challenge my artistic skills here once again. Okay, here's our North Pole. Here's our South Pole. And here's my battery. Potential difference V, like so. So basically what I've done here is I've taken my rectangular loop and I've twisted it up like so down here at the bottom of the diagram. Okay, now because I have twisted this thing through a 180 degree rotation, then the current's I that I had on the top board now look like this. Current I is going like this and like this on this side. And then once again here in red we have our B field, like so. Okay, now take a look at the directions of the force vectors in this case. So over here, for example, on the right-hand side, we now have I, L, cross, B like this. That then gives us a force into the board. Notice that that's opposite of what we had on the right-hand side of the diagram above. Okay, over here on the left-hand side, the force here, in this case, is going to be out of the board, like so. Once again, opposite is what we had on the diagram above. So there are actually two problems here if we basically have a situation that looks like this and we allow it to go through a 180 degree rotation. First problem is that the wires all get twisted up down here at the bottom. That's this rather crappy diagram right here. But in addition to that, the force vector is now in the opposite directions. So then therefore, if I originally torque this thing like so, then it wants to torque back like that. That's of no use to anybody. So then therefore, how are we gonna actually turn this into a functional instrument where we can actually get a large amount of rotational kinetic energy out of it? Well, what we do is we break the circuit. We break the circuit twice per rotation. It looks like this. The same diagram as above, but now what we do right here is we break the circuit and we then insert in place of the blue wires that I had before what are referred to as metal brushes, they're conductors. So there's a metal brush here and there's a metal brush here. Those metal brushes are attached to these portions of the circuit, but they're not physically attached to these portions here. They are just in electrical contact with them twice per rotation. So now watch what happens here when I once again go through a 180 degree rotation. And the easiest way to picture this then therefore is to label the two sides of the rectangular loop in the following manner. Let's call this here side one and this here side two like so. And then we set this up as I've drawn and then basically I have my rectangular loop and then this side here gets kicked out in that direction and this side here gets kicked out or kicked rather in in this direction like so. And then the thing begins to rotate. When it rotates, however, the armature here loses contact with the electrical brushes. So it basically then coasts, if you will, in this direction like so until it goes through a 180 degree rotation. When it goes through a 180 degree rotation, then it comes in contact with the electrical brushes again. That then looks like this. All right, once again, I have to draw this thing. So bear with me here as I do. North Pole. South Pole. B field, battery, bra, 
brushes, armature, like so. Okay, now, side one is over here, like so, on the right-hand side. Side two is over here on the left-hand side. But the direction of the conventional current passing through the rectangular loop is exactly the same as it is on the top four, like so. So then therefore, on this side here, you're going to still get a force vector into the board. Like so. On this side over here, you're still going to get a force vector out of the board. So it's, this is how I describe it. It's like you've kicked the armature again. So on the top board, you start it like so, and then basically kick it in this direction. Okay, it loses contact with the brushes, so it then coasts like so until it comes in contact with the brushes again, and then it gets kicked in the same direction. So it's kick, 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 like so, twice per rotation. Therefore, you can then transform, for example, ultimately electric potential energy associated with the battery into the rotational kinetic energy associated with the motor. And that's the basic idea as to how an electric motor works. I demonstrate this for you in the demonstration video for analog gauges, so I encourage you to take a look at that portion of the video now as well, okay? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and conclude this lecture here. This lecture then finishes for us chapter 27. If I don't record any more lectures today, today's shirt is Nagura Bunjit.